Uh, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to get into your word, to learn more about you, to be transformed by you, to grow closer to you. Lord, we ask that you do something special this morning. Lord, we uh, want to be changed. We want to be transformed. We want to be renewed. So we open our hearts for that. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hey, we have uh, lots of people who uh, watch our services online, whether they're from other countries or whether uh, they are unable to come in to church themselves due to sickness or whatever it might be. So can we welcome our people who are watching online? Give them a big round of applause if you're in the house. Very good. Turn with me, if you can, to 1 Peter 2. 1 Peter 2. When you get there, say, Hallelujah. 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 It says this, For you are a chosen people. You are a royal, you are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. You were created by God to serve. That statement goes against the grain for most of us. You were created by God to serve others. It's kind of countercultural. It's not what we're used to. We live in a crazy world, right? Does anybody else look around and just go, man, this world is nuts. It's a selfish place. It's competitive. Has anyone else noticed that? That the world seems to be incredibly competitive. Everyone is fighting for their place. Everyone pushing and striving to get ahead. We don't know what we're getting ahead of, We just know we want to be further ahead than the person next to us. We don't necessarily know where we're going, but as long as I'm in front of you, I'm okay with that. The other week, I was at uh, going to Bunnings. I like going to Bunnings. And it was a Saturday morning, and I was in the car park of Bunnings, and, and it was packed. There was people everywhere driving around, uh, and... There wasn't like many free parking spots. So I saw this guy walking across and I said, hey, you going? He goes, yep, I'm just over there. I said, cool, no worries. I went around and I pulled up next to him. I had my indicator on. I'd spoken to him. As he got in his car, he referenced me and said, yep, cool, I'll just back out. Indicator on. Everyone could see that was my spot. He reverses out and within a second... This guy pulls straight in to my spot. So I did what any self-respecting pastor of a church would do. I got out of my car, dragged him through the window. and No, I didn't, I didn't do that. <laughs> I might have thought about that for a moment and then repented. And then I gave him a pleasant smile and a wave and drove off to get another spot. But it's interesting, right, how something like that can anger us. That was my spot. Obviously, he thought it was his spot. (laughs) But that's the kind of world we live in. It's competitive. You want to get the best spot by the closest to the door, and it's my right to park there, and why would I wait longer than you, and I shouldn't have to wait at all. We do this. You do this. I know you do this because I'm watching Driving down the road, somebody cuts you off, angry face, straight away. Road rage. Happens all the time. Somebody gets in front of you and we feel justified to be angry at them because they've taken our spot. You know, when you're merging and somebody comes and cuts along the side and they go a little bit on the, in the emergency lane to get in front of you and you're like, that's my spot. Something in our culture, something in our society 
has told us that that's my spot and I should be in front. Something. It's just an unsaid thing. Our culture drives us to compete. To compete with one another. We fight for the best job, for the best house, for the pay rise, for the position at work. We watch TV shows like Australian Idol to watch people compete against each other. As a country, we love competitive sports. We watch the Olympics. We love watching AFL or rugby or soccer. We've created a society that is obsessed with winning, with beating the person next to us. So much so that we watch sporting events to see who's going to win but then we make side bets so we can be the winner picking the winner of the winning. We've gotten so bad at this desire to be first that we are making bets on football games, on all sorts of things, even to the point that we even are willing to watch the federal election and then make bets on who's going to win. In politics, right? It's crazy. We love competing so much, we'll even watch sport like cricket. Crazy. (laughs) Crazy. Is it possible? Is it possible that maybe, just maybe, we've learned the wrong things? That we've learned the wrong way? If we are what we're described as in 1 Peter 2 verse 9, if we are a chosen people, if we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and if we are truly God's very own possession, called to show others the goodness of God, then is it possible that we need to unlearn some things? Is it possible that we have created some neural pathways that are not beneficial and do not glorify God? Point number one, unlearn to be wise. We need to unlearn to be wise. The video we watched just before showed us how our minds are wired a certain way. We get conditioned. Our brains get fixed on a certain way of thinking. And although we might know it to be wrong, we continue doing it anyway. Which is a bit crazy. Although we learn that God created us for something different, we read it in our Bible, we know it to be the truth, yet we struggle to apply it to our lives. We keep living the way our environment pushes us to live. If everyone else is doing it, why shouldn't I do it? We just keep following everybody else. They treated me poorly, I'll treat them poorly. Everybody else is fighting to be first, I'll fight to be first. Everybody else is competing with everyone else, I'm going to compete too. All the parents in the room, give me a quick wave if you're a parent. Parent, yeah. I'm sure uh, that the majority of those parents in the room have had one of your children coming up to you complaining something along the lines of, Mom, Dad, my brother hit me. And you ask the child, why did you hit your sister? And she says, he hit me first. Or when uh, they get in trouble at school, they do something wrong, and you say, why did you do that? And they said, well, Johnny did it. And then our response is like a universal response. Well, if Johnny jumped off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge? It's amusing 
because we find those responses for our children and try to apply them to their life, but seem to struggle applying them to our own life. We look at our children and tell them to grow up and be mature, yet we live our lives directed by everybody else. So in order for us to learn and apply God's plan for our lives, we need to unlearn some things. Amen? Turn to the person next to you and say, unlearn something. Unlearn something. Romans 11, verse 33. Here's a little, um, just a side note for this. I'm going to read from Romans 11, uh, verse 33 to 36, and then the start of Romans 12. The reason we're reading the end of Romans 11 is because the start of Romans 12 starts with the word, therefore. Therefore means because of, so we need to know what it said before, right? So whenever you're reading your Bible and you find something that says, therefore, go back a little bit. You need to find out what it's there for. Make sense? So Romans 11, verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counsellor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Therefore, I urge you, Brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good pleasing and perfect will, the perfect will of God. We actually have to take all that we know and put it before God. Everything that we know, we need to lay it before God. Because if we follow the pattern of the world, we'll be led astray. So we have to lay it before God. The world tells us to look after ourselves The world tells us to get ahead. The world tells us not to help others. The world says, you do you and let me do me. The world is upside down. The world is upside down. I've got a little video here I'd like to play for you of a concerned mother talking about her child. Have we got that one, guys? This is a mother 
genuinely concerned that her child, who has decided to be a cat, is not allowed to lick his paws in class. Now, I'm not trying to poke fun of this lady. I'm just trying to point out that the world is upside down. The world is upside down. The reason that God has told us not to conform to the pattern of this world is because the pattern of this world, the roadmap of this world, leads us to destruction. It leads us to death. It is a crazy world that we live in. Now you think, oh, that's America, that's not happening here. No, it's happening here in schools in this city where they're being petitioned to put litter boxes in the toilets for students. In this city, it's happening. In your country, in your state, people are petitioning schools to put litter boxes in toilets. Now, I'm not a massive cat fan, <laughs> But that's taking it way too far. Sorry, Danny, I know you are. <laughs> but the, 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 this is just an example of some of the things that are going on and how crazy the world is. But I think it's always been crazy. I think it's always been upside down when we run by the pattern of the world. There is this dude called Paul. We call him the Apostle Paul. We talk about him a lot in churches. He established churches all over the place, in different cities and towns. Uh, and this is what he wrote to one of those churches. It was um, in a city called Corinth. And in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 2 to 5, this dude Paul says this. He says, I beg you, that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We hear a lot about learning new things and yes, we should be learning new things. But I'm here today to challenge us to unlearn some things. Because some of the things that we've learned in the world are of no use to you in your journey with God whatsoever. We need to unlearn the things that aren't God's way. If it isn't God's way, it's not our way. If it isn't God's way, it's not your way. It wasn't meant for you. Pastor Paul Bartlett's a, a, a pastor in our nation and in his book, Rethink It, he said this. It's a great quote. And he said, unlearning is a process that unlocks something powerful. It turns a key on a thought that enables you to walk through new doors of positive change. So we need to unlearn some things in order to get back to the truth. Next point, we serve an unchanging God. In this ever-changing world, we need an unchanging God. Psalm 90 verse 2, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. I'm going to read this in the message translation because it's nice. That's all, the only reason. It says, God, it seems you've been our home forever. Long before the mountains were born, 
long before you brought earth itself to birth, from once upon a time to kingdom come, you are God. He is all that we need. God is our shepherd. God doesn't check the weather. He makes the weather. He doesn't defy gravity. He created gravity. He isn't affected by health because he has no body. In John 4.24, Jesus says, God is spirit and his worshippers must worship in the spirit and in truth. Since he has no body, God has no limitations. He is equally active in Perth as he is in Penang. Cambodia or Kalgoorlie, it doesn't matter. In Australia or Afghanistan, he is God. King David in the Psalms asked this, he said in Psalm 139 verses 7 to 10, he says, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make a bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. Since no one and no thing brought him here, no act created him, no act can take him away. He doesn't fear earthquakes. He doesn't tremble at tornadoes. Jesus, our God, sleeps through storms and calms the winds with a word. Cancer doesn't trouble him and cemeteries don't disturb him. He was here before they came and he'll be after they're gone. A friend can hold your hand at your deathbed. But our God has defeated the grave. Philosophers can debate the meaning of life, but all you need is the one who created life. You don't need a genie in a bottle or three wishes. No, you need a God who places a hundred billion stars in our galaxy and a hundred billion galaxies in our universe. You need a God who can shape a lump of flesh into 75 billion nerve cells, each with as many as 10,000 connections to other cells, powered by electricity, dumped it in your skull and called it a brain. That's what our God does. And you need a God who, while so mind-numbingly mighty, can come in the soft of night and touch you with the tenderness of a hug. You need Jesus, the unchanging one. Hebrews 13 verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We get blown to and fro by the storms and the winds of the world, but Jesus is the rock on which we stand on. Amen? Jesus is the rock on which we stand on. It is through him that we transform our minds. If the musicians want to come and help me as we get to the end here. The last point, you were created to serve. It is countercultural. It goes against what we're taught our whole lives. You were created to serve, to be a servant of Jesus Christ. Scripture after scripture after scripture. Matthew 25, 35 to 40. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me, says the Lord. Romans 12 verse 10. Be devoted to one another in love. Honour one another above yourselves. 
1 Peter 4, verse 10 to 11. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Do not be slothful in zeal, but be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Everything that you have been given is a gift from the Lord. Some of you have been given an incredible gift of hospitality. Your gift of hospitality was bestowed upon you for the purpose of serving others. Some of you have been given a gift of teaching. The gift of teaching has been bestowed upon you in order to share it with others. Some of you have been given a gift of generating wealth, incredible business people, great minds for money. God gave you that gift so you can serve others and glorify Him. Some of you have prophetic gifts where God shows you things that are going to come to pass. He didn't give you that gift to puff you up. He gave it to serve the body, to encourage people, to equip people to lift them up. Some of you have been given a gift, a pastoral gifting, where you have just an empathy that is nothing short of supernatural. It's to share with others. You are created to serve. Mark 10, verse 45, for even the Son of Man, Jesus, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Galatians 5.13 For you were called to freedom. (laughs) Do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, serve one another. Ephesians 6.7-8 Rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. God has created you to serve. If you have a sense in your life that something is missing, that there's a gap somewhere. You're feeling unfulfilled, like you haven't quite achieved what you need to achieve. Can I challenge you this morning to take that feeling to the Lord and ask Him, is there an area that I need to serve others? Am I missing it here, Lord? Have I grown accustomed to the way of the world instead of to the way of the Lord? So many of us are searching for our purpose. What is my purpose? What am I here for? What am I created for? When we were at Casuarina Prison, the question got asked, if you could ask God one question, what would that question be? And there was a few different questions, but one common one was, why am I here? What's the point of all this? To honour God through serving others. To honour God through serving others. God Himself sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to become man. To take upon your sin and my sin. To take upon the sin of the world so that we would no longer be separated from God that we could come into His presence boldly and have a personal relationship with Him. Jesus was nailed to a cross. He was beaten, unrecognizable, it says, to serve you and me. Then the power of the Holy Spirit after His death came upon Him and raised Him back to life so that you and I can secure eternity in heaven. Eternity in heaven.
you are created to serve. The world will try and lie to you and tell you to look after number one, to not worry about the next person, to put yourself first. Well, this book says something very, very different. Very, very different. The purpose of our lives is to find the gifts that God has put upon us, that He's entrusted to us, and then to share those gifts with others. Part of the journey of using your individual gift, the gift that God has given you personally, is knowing that you are created to serve others with that gift to serve others, to love others, and to show others the love of Christ. If we want to see revival in our city, if we want to see Armadale one to Jesus, if we want to see family members and loved ones set free if we want to see a mighty move of God, we have to follow what God's telling us to do. Amen. And He's called us to serve, to love, to care for, to pray for, to tell people about Jesus. With every eye closed and every head bowed, Holy Spirit, we ask for your presence in this place. Come now. Come. Heavenly Father, we've spent so many years being compelled by humanity, by the world, to do things a certain way. And Lord, we need a revelation this morning. We need you to come and impart into us the call on our lives to serve others. Help us to turn from the way of the world, to take those thoughts captive and to start to honour you with our lives. May we be living sacrifices. Lord, may you be freeing people right now so that they can serve you and serve others. Lord, we pray right now that you start to break off the things that oppress people and hold them down. The sense that we're missing something, Lord. Fulfill us, Lord. We we need fulfillment from you. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Lord, we repent this morning for living outside of the pattern you created for us. We ask that you transform our minds. Transform our minds. We choose today to recommit our lives to you, to being disciples of Jesus, serving you and serving others. Lord, we pray that you give us an excitement in our spirit to do just that, that we get a glimpse of what you see in us and for us. Lord, help us to see others the way that you see them, to have the same kind of love and affection for people that you have. Help us to truly serve others. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Again, with every eye closed and nobody looking around, if you're here this morning and you know that you need to make a commitment, you need to give your heart to Jesus. As I talk about this guy, Jesus, who died on a cross so that you could have relationship with God. As I talk about this guy who went through excruciating pain to wear your sin, to take your punishment. If something in you says, I need to make a commitment today, to be in right relationship with Him. Then with nobody looking around, all I'm going to do is ask you to 
put your hand up where you are. I'm not going to call you out the front. I just want to know who I'm praying for. Yeah, I see that hand. Well done. And that hand there as well. And this hand here. So good. And here. Yes. And there as well. Amazing. Amazing. Is there anybody else? You just know that God is calling you today. It might be a decision for the first time. Yeah. Or it might be a decision again. Yes, I see that hand and that one over there as well. Some of us in this place need to get right with God. Is there anyone else? I want to rush this moment. Is God calling you? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, God. Lord, right now in this place, Lord, I thank you for these courageous individuals who've made the best decision of their lives, whether it be a first-time commitment or a recommitment to following you and living for you. Lord, may you bless them. May you be right now revealing yourself to them in a new way. Lord, start to reform and refashion the pathways of their mind. Give them the strength and ability and the courage to be able to take every thought captive and make it obedient to you, Heavenly Father. Lord, in this moment, in this time, we acknowledge that you sent your Son, Jesus, to bear our sin, to become sin so that we could have relationship with you. Lord, we acknowledge and we confess that he died on that cross, but three days later rose again in the power of the Holy Spirit, was raised to life to give us access to eternity in heaven. Lord, we thank you that he ascended to the throne room of heaven itself to be seated at your right hand. And Lord, from this moment on, we choose to give you all the honour and all the glory. And Lord, we promise to wholeheartedly serve you for all our days. May all that we say and all that we do be pleasing unto you and glorifying to your name. Heavenly Father, we worship you and we glorify you and we do it all in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. And if you believe it, say Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Can we give God a clap of praise? Let's stand to our feet. Let's stand to our feet. Shake off the cobwebs. I don't know if you know this. I've said it a few times, but I'm going to remind you, and I'll probably say it again and again. But the Scriptures tell us, the Holy Scriptures, the Word of God, tell us that when one person makes a decision to follow Jesus, that all heaven rejoices. So how much more should we be rejoicing right now and praising the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings? Not because we're tired, not because we're stressed, not because we're down, but because we love Him and He is God. Because we don't conform to the pattern of this world, but we're transformed by the renewal of our minds. Amen. Can we give God a real clap of praise? Very good. Very good. Hey, uh, hang around after the service. If you're new here, we want to meet you. There is a welcome lounge. But can I encourage you all uh, to come back tonight, 5 p.m. The anointing service is going to be epic. If you need to go and have a little nana nap, get your energy back, get some food, go and do that. But come back 5 p.m. Bring your kids, bring your loved ones, bring your mum, bring your dad, bring your neighbour, Ring up someone you work with, someone from school, whoever it is. If you know people that need a touch of heaven, bring them. Bring them. Because the Holy Spirit is going to do something powerful in this place tonight. Amen? Very good. Very good. Hey, have a wonderful afternoon, and we'll see you all very soon.